thank you. Worthy Vice Chancellor, Professor Jaspal Singh Sanduji, Professor Simon Belinch, the guest faculty of this Gyan course, Professor N. P. Saniji, Head Department of Physics, Professor Palvinder Singh, the local coordinator of the Gyan program, uh, dear colleagues, faculty members, students and participants, good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you. We also specially welcome Ms. Sophie Belinch, the daughter of Professor Belinch, who is here in our university. I am extremely thankful to our dynamic uh, new Vice Chancellor, Professor Jaspal Singh Sanduji, for taking some time off from his very uh, busy schedule and for kindly agreeing to inaugurate this five-day lecture series program. Dear colleagues, Professor Sandhu is an internationally recognized orthopedic surgeon. He is an outstanding teacher, researcher, and a very able administrator. He is a fellow of many distinguished scientific bodies and has over 250 publications in uh, international top quality journals. And Professor Sandhu was in fact the first person in India to establish the Department of Sports Medicine at Guru Nanak Dev University. I know that he transformed all the departments that he took charge of, whether it was the Department of Sports Medicine and Physiotherapy, the Academic Staff College, and more recently, the University Grants Commission. Our university is going to see a phase transition and phenomenal growth and surely it will rise to great heights under his vision and leadership. Friends, this Gyan course uh, really invited overwhelming response and as many as 97 participants from uh, all over India, from all major institutes and universities in India, they enrolled in the Gyan course. Uh, however, due to the disturbances in the recent few days, uh, many of the participants could not make to this program, uh, but as many as 15 participants from different parts of the country, they have already arrived in Amritsar, and uh, few more are expected today and tomorrow. The singular reason for this overwhelming interest in this course is the world fame and expertise of Professor Simon, Simon Belinch in this area of research. Professor Belinch has more than 20 years experience in developing and applying techniques to study local structure of materials using X-ray, uh, neutron diffraction and electron diffraction techniques. He earned his PhD degree in material science and engineering from the University of Pennsylvania in 1992 and then he spent almost 13 years as a faculty in the, in the uh, Michigan State University. In 2008, he took up his present position as a professor of material science and applied physics and applied mathematics at Columbia University and also a physicist at the Brookhaven National Laboratory, United States. Professor Belinch has published more than 200 papers in very high impact factor journals like Nature, Science, Physical Review Letters. He is a fellow of American Physical Society and Neutron Scattering Society of America, a former Fulbright Fellow, a Sloane, a Sloane Fellow, and he has earned a number of awards including being honored in 2001 for his contributions to the United States as an immigrant by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. In 2010, he got the Hanwalt Award of the International Center for Diffraction Data. He got the University Distinguished Faculty Award at Michigan State, the Thomas Osgood Undergraduate Teaching Award. He is a section editor of Acta Crystallographica Section A, and he regularly chairs and participates in reviews of major facilities and federally funded programs. Professor Belinch 
was also an invited speaker in the International uh, Union of Crystallography Conference 2017 uh, that was held last week at Hyderabad. This course, Local and Nanostructure Determination of Complex Nanostructured Materials Using Scattering Methods, is designed by Professor Belinch. And the physics and chemistry students, they know that nanostructured materials and nanomaterials have some very special properties. They have some very special optical, uh, electrical, mechanical properties. And that arises because of their small size. To understand the properties, to model the properties, we need to understand the structure of the materials. And the techniques available are diffraction techniques. However, because of small size, the diffraction peaks are very broad. And the phase analysis and the exact structure determination becomes difficult. And to overcome this, we have a technique of powder diffraction analysis. And Professor Belinch, uh, is a world authority on powder, on uh, pair distribution function analysis. Uh, and I can assure you that there is no better person than Professor Simon Belinch who can teach you PDF analysis. Uh, there will be both lectures and practical sessions. And the lectures will be telecast live on the web. Participants are really fortunate to attend this course. Uh, I now request our worthy Vice Chancellor, Professor Jaspal Singh Sanduji, to kindly inaugurate this program and address the faculty, students, and the participants. Thank you. Good morning, Professor Khanna, my friends, Professor Annie, and others. Uh, it's a ritual to call the Vice Chancellor worthy. But you can't be worthy till you are prove yourself to be worthy. So I really appreciate that you don't dress me. I'm, I am one of you only. And just the first among you, that's all. But in future, please avoid the word worthy. It doesn't just suit in the current system itself. I just joined as a vice chancellor four days ago, four or five days ago. And I come back to my alma mater, which has produced whatever I am today. So it's a big honor for me to serve in the same institution where you know, which has made me a doctor, which has made where I developed a department, which gave me the secretaryship of University Grants Commission, now the vice chancellorship. So uh, I have been, the reason why I left or chose to be a vice chancellor here was that I've seen this university somehow going down the NIRF scale. You know, we were ranked at one time as 13th, 13th in, the, in the country. Now in the last uh, year's NIRF, which was obviously run by my organization there in University Grants Commission, collaboration with the NBA and the ministry, we have gone down substantially. And the reason why it went down was that we were not doing very well in research, and the perception also was not very good about the university in the field. Uh, with programs like Gyan, which Professor Bling is going to you know, conduct lectures for the next four or five days, we do, we do tend to change this, what is happening in this university, and make it more vibrant again. Uh, Vice Chancellor's spine is open door policy. I must tell you, and Professor Sani must have already, you know, he knows this thing. You, anybody can walk in. If somebody's inside, you just wait for a turn and come in. That's all. Be it a student, be it a faculty, it doesn't matter. I use the same kind of procedures which I, I used in UGC also. You can, uh, cannot sit on a pedestal and work as a, as a worker also. So anybody, and my stakeholders are my dear students. We want to make them really employable. It's not that it should be a degree vending machine. This university should be the ones which produce employable uh, students who can get jobs the moment they leave the university. And they are, they are put at a pedestal that they can really walk into good institutions. So uh, when we started Gyan, this is also one of the initiators, uh, Professor Bling, which I took over when as the secretary was initiated from our organization itself. This was now IIT Khadakpur is one who's coordinating it. As a primarily to sensitize the students to the latest in the world. And, uh, and so this has been a very successful program. I just, uh, Professor Pravinder told me yesterday that there have been six people who came last year and the six scholars, seven scholars are going to probably come this year. And that's a large number. And uh, obviously with the, my friends in IIT, Kharagpur, I hope to have more people coming to this university and become more international and more uh, known outside this uh, sphere of Punjab itself. 
Uh, I've just, I, I don't have much association with physics. Only thing I know about physics is my friends who are in the physics department sitting all around. And the other thing was that I hated the subject when I was doing my MBBS. So that was the only subject where I had to have a tuition to understand what physics was. <laughs> so, so I don't know, I don't know much. That I, why I chose to be a, be a doctor was because I was so afraid that I could be unsuccessful as an engineer. Otherwise, engineering would have been a much better subject for me. But still, that's the situation. But uh, it's a beautiful subject, and I ho do hope that Professor Blink, you know, makes new knowledge, and you understand what he wants to say, and you also dwell the way he has dwelt. Um, again, I would like to repeat, this is your university. You first own it. Why I came here? Because I think whatever I am today is because of this. And you are there because you are because of this. And you and your students, you're going to be, you know, the, fact, uh, the alumni of this organization. Wherever you go, you represent, you know, and Kanak Dev University. So kindly, kindly own it first. I went to the hostels yesterday evening. Uh, I found it that they were not kept very nicely, even by the students. So it's your university, keep it clean. Whatever the problems they are, just come over to the Vice Chancellor's office. Just walk in. Don't come with complaints. Complaints I hate. I never liked in, in University Grants Commission also anybody complaining. Say this is positive thing you wanted done. And I can assure you that as long as I'm there, I put my best and see that best is done. So. Anyway, I can't talk about physics, I told you so, but have a good time. And first thing, I have, hope you have a nice time in Amritsar and you have very productive seminars for the next four or five days. Thank you so much. May I request Professor Sani uh, to kindly uh, give some information about the activities of physics department? Honorable Vice Chancellor Saab, uh, Dr. Jaspal Singh Sandhu, Professor Bling, Professor Palwinder, uh, Professor Khanna, uh, Professor Sekho, and uh, my colleagues and uh, participants and dear students. I will not uh, take much time. I will say only a few words, but our Vice Chancellor has uh, shared with you. I will support uh, his views. Uh, in our department, we have such a faculty who is working very hard for the last many years, we can say since the beginning of the department, the day by day when we have very new techniques and we have to work according to those techniques and we have to keep the research up to the high standard. And due to that reason, we have uh, different grants from the funding agency. Uh, that's how we have SAP level 1, level 2. Then we have FIST level 0, level 1. Now we have applied for the level 2 which is for the amount of 10 crores and uh, we are working, our, our staff is working so hard, our students are working so hard that due to that we are impact factor in the university per capita is uh, I think uh, it is uh, higher than all the departments. So this is the achievements of our department but we will keep on working on the same line since we have so many facilities in our department as well as in the central facility we have new equipment. I will also advise my students to put more time, more efforts, so that we can uh, 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 do high-quality research work. Okay. Only thing is, uh, for the previous years, there were some problems. And so although we have so many instruments, so many facilities, but we were uh, having some problem from the, say, congenial atmosphere. But now I hope, since our colleague, I, can, I, I must say, our colleague, our friend, he is a vice chancellor, he is our leader, he has such a courage and strength that we can keep our university up to high levels and uh, I assure you that's up, we will keep on working very hard and we will put all efforts to make our university among the top university in the India. Uh, in, uh, and I also hope all the participants and my students, you will enjoy the series of lecture from Professor Bling. He is well known uh, physicist, okay, and he is well known experimentalist as Dr. Khannan told you. The, I hope you will enjoy the series of lecture. I also uh, request you, please attend the lecture seriously. Whenever you have free time in your class, you come here directly and attend the lecture, and you can interact with the, uh, with the Professor Bling so that you can make your connection later on for collaboration, for going abroad, okay, in this way. I thank you very much for coming over here. I also 
uh, thank our uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Sandhu, uh, for inaugurating this workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Palvinder Singh is the coordinator of the Gyan program. Uh, I request him to give an overview of the Gyan series lectures that we have been having. <coughs> Thank you. Professor Dispar Singh Sandhu, Vice Chancellor, Guru Nanak Dev University, Professor Simon, Professor NPS Saini, Professor Kanna, Professor Sekho, colleagues from Physics Department, and dear participants. It is my pleasure to welcome you all on the opening day of this Gyan course. Since this is probably the first uh, appearance of our new Vice Chancellor in any program in the university, so I would like to say in one sentence only that we, from the depth of my heart, we congratulate Sir, to you for your new assignment and really welcome you and we are thankful to you for taking up this responsibility and we hope as you have already told that the university will achieve new heights, new achievements under your guidance and leadership. As far as the Gyan program is concerned, the present federal government in 2014 started with a new idea that our institutes, universities should organize one week or two week courses in which the experts, faculty from the different countries can be invited for a series of lectures. So during this uh, program, the basic idea was to provide an interactive atmosphere to the faculty as well as the students so that they can interact with the expert faculty and the new ideas can be generated and not only up to the one week or two week courses that interaction can be uh, making further in the future any faculty member or the student can interact with the expert for any problem to discuss new ideas. And the courses that were organized so far in the first phase of uh, this program up to uh, 2016, then in the second phase up to December 2017, about 1100 courses have been approved by the ministry. And out of these, about 800 courses have been successfully organized. And all these courses are recorded, webcast, and they are available on the internet. And uh, recently, UGC has uh, made this uh, program, this, uh, these courses to make available under the MOOC program. And many of these courses are available where the different departments or the institutes can have the access to these courses and can make part of their curriculum. So that, that is the sense of uh, this uh, uh, Global Academic Initiative Network program under which we are gathered today for, uh, for the starting of this course. As far as our university is concerned, since the university was having the university with potential for excellence program, so in the first phase, this university was chosen to have uh, to submit the proposals under this program. Uh, different faculty members from this university submitted the proposals and so far 13 proposals have been approved for this university only. Seven courses have already been uh, organized and today it is the eighth course that we are going to start uh, where Professor Blins is the uh, speaker and uh, he will deliver a series of lectures in the next five days. As you know, to organize these courses is not an easy task. It is first to make, to consult the foreign faculty, to make a common program, to, to have a, a particular proposal that is suitable to our faculty as well as the students. Then the proposal is submitted to the uh, National Gyan Committee and 
passing through different stages ultimately the proposal is uh, it is uh, uh, sanctioned and that takes about uh, three to four months i am really thankful to the faculty members who have taken this responsibility to to submit the proposal to contact the foreign faculty and then to organize uh, this type of courses uh, i am really thankful to professor atul and kindly join me to have a to give a big hand to professor atul for organizing this program so once again i am thankful to all the participants and uh, my sincere thanks are to the ministry of human resource development for funding this course and i am also thankful to the university authorities for providing all the infrastructure for organizing this type of uh, program and really thankful to professor sandeep sharma from computer science who is always helpful for the webcasting responsibility of uh, these courses all the earlier seven courses and today also he is available to make sure that there is no any fault in the in the webcasting of the program so i am hopeful professor blinch will enjoy the hospitality of amritsar and the participants will have the fruitful discussion with the expert thank you very much thank you professor parvind singh for your kind words uh, we are really happy that the vice chancellor professor jaspal singh sandhu has started uh, the inaugurations from this program and in particular from the physics department so we want to honor professor sandhu with a memento from the physics department uh, professor sani and professor palvinder singh kindly present a memento to the vice chancellor <clears throat> and may i now request the vice chancellor professor sandhu to present a memento to professor simon blinch <clears throat> we have another very special guest ms sophie blinch i request the vice chancellor to present a gift a special gift for ms sophie it's a fulkari that's the specialty of state of punjab with that we conclude the inauguration session i thank the vice chancellor professor simon blinch professor sani professor palvinder singh and all our dear colleagues faculty members uh, we will begin the technical sessions from 11 and now we break for tea please join us D stands for molecular dynamics. The the inputs to these programs are the structure solution, and the output from those programs are the properties. So what we do is we do that we get the structure, we do the DFT, and we we compute the properties. And we've already measured the properties. And by doing it both ways around, what we do is we gain understanding. We start to understand about how the property got the material, got the how the material got the property that it has. And when we have understanding, that's when we can be more creative. We can go back instead of just doing trial and error synthesis. We can use much more targeted synthesis. We can, we can, um, we can basically use the knowledge we've gained from this to predict what we should be doing next. 
the key step in this is actually the, the structure and the diffraction experiment to do the structure. So without the structure solution, we can't do DFT and MD and we can't do these properties. And so that's why there's this very close relationship between knowing the structure and then being able to design materials with interesting properties. Um, and structure solution uh, historically has been crystallography. <coughs> And if you go to the IUCR, this is the International Union of Crystallography. If you go to the IUCR website, they list 48 Nobel Prizes that are in some way or other associated with crystallography. Some of them are very centrally uh, related to crystallography. The, um, the, the solution of DNA or the solution of uh, or, or direct methods in crystallography, which, which revolutionized crystallography. Some are more loosely uh, loosely uh, connected. But the point is the structure solution is really important. Um, and crystallography has had a profound effect, but it, it measures the structure of crystals. And crystals are idealizations of real material. So when we have that motorcycle, if you look at that synthetic motorcycle, a lot of what's on that motorcycle is not crystalline, not made of crystalline material. So what we, what we want to do in, in my group is we want to say, okay, we want to have, the, we want to get, we want to know the structure of things, but we want to know the structure of real materials, not just ideal crystals. And real materials are more complex than ideal crystals. So a real material, it has, it might have a crystal structure, or it may be amorphous. A lot of people working on amorphous materials has no crystal structure. But in any case, it, it can have a morphology, the shape and size. And this very often is on the nanoscale, so nanometers, billionths of a meter. Um, it can have a surface reconstruction. It means the atoms on the surface rearrange. Uh, the surface can have a termination or a dressing. So on the surface, there can be some organic ligands or some other things covering the surface or some oxide layer. Um, the, material can have, the material can have interfaces, heterogeneities, can be phase separated. It's not necessarily this perfect single crystal. It can have stuff in it. It has all kinds of defects. Okay, these are real materials. And actually, if you're a material scientist in this room, what you know is actually all of these defects are really, really important for giving the material its properties. So if we didn't care about these defects, if it didn't affect the performance of the material, we wouldn't care. But actually, these things do. So here, so here are some examples. If you're interested in quantum dots, these are semiconducting nanoparticles. Um, they have very interesting optical properties, for example. But the presence or absence of surface trap states, which is a defect in the material, determines their properties a great deal. Let's say you want to make a photovoltaic, so you want to turn sunlight into electricity. Again, the performance depends on uh, charge transfer and charge extraction. So the light comes in, it separates electron hole pairs. Then you have to, so you've kind of created this little electrical dipole. But in order to, for it to turn into electricity, you have to separate the positive and the negative charge. But then you want it, you want it to run your iPhone, right? That means you need a current. So you have to get those separated electron holes, electrons and holes into a circuit and into your iPhone. So, you, so charge extraction is really important. So what, what people are tending to do is they're tending to, to make, make the, uh, design these photovoltaics with very elaborate structures that allow the electron hole pairs to not only be created, but to be extracted. Catalysis is an extremely important example, and it all happens on the surface of materials. So you have a, a particle like platinum, some chemical comes down, it binds to the surface of, of platinum, and then it, some chemistry will happen, and then the products will go away. That chemistry is happening on the surface, and as I told you, there's surface reconstruction, surface relaxation. Um, batteries, the electrodes in batteries, basically lithium is going out and coming in, going out and coming in as you charge and discharge the battery. That lithium has to get has to get access. It has to get in. It has to get out. Again, it means you want to make some structure in there that allows that to happen. So, 
these are just examples where defects are important. It's important to understand real materials, not just the idealized one. And you can even get emergent properties. So one which is very interesting for physicists is that actually you can take two insulators together, <coughs> make an interface between two insulators, and actually get superconductivity in that, in, in that interface. And superconductivity is not a property of insulators. It's a property of metals. Um, but you can put two insulators together and get superconductivity, so that's what we call an emergent property. In that case, we're getting this emergent property um, when it shouldn't exist at all because it's the insulating material. Okay, so defects are important. Uh, so I said this again and again. We want to, we need to know the average structure because we want to engineer real materials. And so when we do this process here, this thing up here needs to be a real material, not, a, not a, just a structure. So this brings me to the nanostructure problem. So that's all great. We've had crystallography for 100 years. Why don't we just keep using crystallography to, uh, on these real materials? <coughs> and what we can do is we can look at the crystal structure problem, which has been solved. So the crystal structure problem goes like this. Um, you're a chemist, and you've made a crystal. And the question is, what's its structure? So there's a crystal that I downloaded off the internet. But you've made a crystal. The question is, what's its structure? All right, here's the solution to this problem. You give it to your grad student. He puts it on the x-ray machine. He pushes the button. And the machine tells for the structure. That's how you solve crystal structures these days. Then she tells you, and then you tell your chemist friend, and then you write a paper, you become rich and famous, or famous, or nothing. Okay, so <clears throat> this, is a, this is an example of what I would call a solved problem. So if you can put something on a machine and push the button, and the machine tells you the answer, that's a good example of a solved problem. So largely speaking, crystallography is a solved problem. Now, when I give this talk and I have crystallographers in the audience, they all get mad at me because I just told them that the thing that they're devoting their life to and working on is basically boring, solved problem. So sometimes, actually, the machine gets stuck and the machine doesn't know the answer. And then typically, two things happen. The first one is the most common. You throw away the crystal. But the second one is also a possibility. You make it the subject of her thesis to solve that crystallographic problem. Anyway, but this is the crystal structure problem. OK, now the nanostructure problem. The nanostructure problem is very simple, uh, similar, I mean. You're a chemist or a material scientist, and you've made a material, and you want to know where the atoms are. But because you're like cutting edge 21st century material scientist, you want to make a nanomaterial, so you've made a nanomaterial. So this is a picture of artist's impression of what it might look like. It could be a cadmium selenide nanoparticle, let's say. It's got a few thousand atoms, and it's only three or four nanometers across in diameter. But as I pointed out, we need to know the structure. In order to use DFP, in order to predict the structures, in order to understand the material. So we still want to answer this question, what's the structure? So in my group, we're not very smart. So we always try the problem, we try the solution that's already been tried. So we give the nanoparticle to the student, and then she puts it on the x-ray machine. That's if she doesn't drop it. Like, it's not easy to mount a nanoparticle on an x-ray machine. Right? But then she manages to get it on the x-ray machine, and she pushes the button, and absolutely nothing comes out the x-ray machine. And the reason is that there's not enough atoms in this object to scatter enough x-rays that you can measure them. So that's problem number one, is just getting a signal from the nanoparticle. OK, but um, we're, not, we're not that dumb. So what we say is, OK, let's take hundreds and thousands of nanoparticles, and we'll put them in a capillary. Capillary is a little tiny tube. So we have a powder of them. And then we'll put that in the beam. Then we'll get a signal because we've got many more atoms. So we, put, we push the button. And what comes out is actually a diffraction pattern, but it looks like this. 
So when you push the button, the machine can't tell you the structure. All it can do is it can give you a diffraction pattern. And what's characteristic about this diffraction pattern is it looks like it doesn't contain much information. It only has like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven peaks in it. And so the question is then, if your, if your scattering pattern looks like this, and it only has seven peaks in it, and each peak contains roughly three bytes of information, right? The position, the width, and the intensity. So three sevens are 21, and some of these peaks are overlapped. So you've got somewhere between 15 and 17 types of information in this data set, and you need to solve a crystal structure from it. And it's, it's hard. Basically, you can't. So that means that we're not going to be able to design nanomaterials. We're not going to have the same revolution in nanomaterials that we had in crystallography, unless we can do something about this. And so there's different people doing different things. The thing that we're working on is this total scattering PDF analysis, which is the subject of this week's lecture. So it's the atomic pair distribution function analysis method. And basically, it's quite simple schematically. What, what we do is we take our powder of nanoparticles and we put it in the beam. And then we collect data as a function of scattering angle and we get the powder pattern. So this is a crystalline material, so it actually has frag peaks in it. But this is raw, this is raw data. Um, so it has experimental artifacts in it, and it has not properly normalized. So what we do is we do data corrections to get from the raw data to a function that we call S of Q, structure function. So this is the structure-dependent part of this measure. And there's two very special things about how we measure this structure function. So this is like a powder diffraction pattern that you measure in the lab. And probably many of you actually measure powder diffraction patterns. That's all this is. But there's two key things. One key thing is that this variable Q is momentum transfer. We measure it up to a very high value, so much higher than you would normally measure in your lab. So a lab diffractometer, which has proper K alpha, radiation, you would only get this little bit down here. So we need uh, special short wavelength high energy sources to be able to do this. And the other thing is that this contains Bragg peaks. These sharp things here are Bragg peaks. But it also contains diffuse scattering. So if you look carefully, there's kind of oscillating diffuse signals. What we do then is we take this complete structure function and we Fourier transform it. So we end up with this function g of r. This is the pair distribution function. And it's related to s of q through this sine Fourier transform. So we take this guy, s of q. Actually, this guy is q times s of q minus 1. So we take s of q, we subtract 1, we multiply by q. I'll explain later what q is. And then we do this sine Fourier transform. And we end up with this guy. And this is the PDF. So it's actually straightforward to obtain this function here directly from the data. Now, this function has one axis g, and it has another axis r. So g is a probability. By the way, um, if anyone has questions, you can raise your hand and ask questions anytime. Happy to be interrupted. Um, this has a probability on this axis and distance on this axis. And the probability measure is a, is a probability of finding two atoms separated by this distance. So this is a high number. So there's a high probability of two atoms in this material being separated by this distance, which is 2.75 angstrom. So it turns out that this is a perovskite material, and it has an octahedron in it with a manganese in the middle and oxygens around it. And this is the oxygen-oxygen distance on that octahedron, and it has a very high multiplicity, a multiplicity of 12 because of the edges of the octahedron. So there's a very high probability of finding two atoms separated by this distance. But each of these peaks in here tells you how atoms are separated. And so this is like a one-dimensional map of the inside of your material. Um, and crucially, it's hard to see, but this is a 10. And that's an A for angstrom. So this is 10 angstrom. 10 angstroms is one nanometer. 
So this function is actually giving you information, structural information exactly at the nanoscale. So in principle, this function here is something that we could probe. It's giving us structural information at the nanoscale, which is exactly what we want. So um, I started doing this method in 1989 or so, or 1988 maybe. And um, at that time, it was not really, hadn't been developed at all. My PhD advisor was Takeshi Yagami at the University of Pennsylvania. And so we did a lot of the development together. And then I went on to take a faculty position at Michigan State and did more development. And over time, it's become actually quite a, quite a widely used field, a w widely used technique. But one thing that's the, the one step that helped that was actually the use of uh, high intensity x ray sources. And we would go to CHESS, which is the high energy uh, synchrotron at Cornell, which is in New York State, about four hours away from uh, New York City. <coughs> and we would go there and we would put our sample in the beam, and you have to collect data over a very wide angular range to get the high Q that we're after. And, um, we would, we would um, have a point detector, so we would move it one point at a time. And it took a really long time. We would collect data for hours and hours. So one data set took 12 hours. <laughs> so you had to be a physicist to love this technique. But in 2003, uh, in collaboration with Claire Gray's group at Stony Brook and uh, her student, Pete Chupat, we came up with a much more rapid way of doing the experiment. So what we did is we, we went to a source which had very short wavelength x-rays. So the accelerating voltage was something like um, 80 or 100 kilovolts. Copper K-alpha is 8 kilovolts. So it's 100 times more energetic than copper K-alpha radius. And we took a 2D detector, which had a large area. And we took the detector and we simply, the sample goes here, and we simply push the detector as close as we could to the sample. So two things happened. The short wavelength X-rays took the whole reciprocal space and squeezed it in the forward scattering direction. And then the 2D detector pushed very, very close to the sample, gave us this large acceptance angle. And we were able to get a complete diffraction pattern in one shot. So from some strongly scattering material like nickel, it went from a 12-hour measurement to a one-second measurement. So we got a four order of magnitude increase in throughput. And this basically revolutionized this method because now um, if you had access to one of those synchrotrons, you could do these experiments very rapidly. And so it started to become interesting to chemists and material scientists who wanted to characterize their material, not do some heroic measurement. It took a very long time. This experiment right there. And there are no moving parts. Yeah. Okay, so that came out of the x-ray machine when the student pushed the button. And what we're going to do is we're going to do some magic on this. We're going to take this pattern and we're going to turn it into a PDF. But um, what you see is that we measured over a very wide range of cues. Thing is happening. So why did we do that? Why did we spend so much time me measuring nothing? <clears throat> now, one of the normalization steps during the data processing is you divide by the scattering cross-section of the sample. The scattering cross-section of the sample is the square of the atomic form factor. So the, the atomic form factor looks like this. It's a very smoothly varying function like that. And so we're going to divide the blue by the red curve. Now, if you divide two large numbers, by each other. Even if the numbers are different by a little bit, you get a large enhancement in signal. So when we do this division, we get this curve. So this curve is the same as that one after we've done the normalization. And so this peak here is that one, and this peak here is that one. What you can see is out here where there was no intensity, there's actually quite rich intensity. You just have to apply this correct normalization to get it. And now we have much more information that we can use to do a structured transfer, structured determination. And you can see that the signal actually went out further. We just stopped it. 
So we can get PDF from data. We can also get PDF from model. So if we have a structural model, we can compute the PDF. So you're going to be doing this in your hands-on session. So what we do is we put an atom at the center. And then you go out some distance until you find another atom. So this is graphene. So it's, graphene is really hot right now. So you have to have graphene in your source. You can take them seriously as a scientist. Right? So here's my graphene. So you go out 1.4 angstroms and you put a peak there. And then you broaden the peak and put a delta function there, but you broaden it to make it a Gaussian because of thermal motion of the atoms are moving. And then you go out further until you find another atom and you put a peak at that distance. Now this one is a higher peak because it has a higher multiplicity. This was multiplicity three. This is multiplicity six. So that peak's higher. And then we go further out and further out and we find more and more atoms and we place peaks at those positions. And now what we have is we have software programs that will do this for you now and they'll also do regression. So that means that they'll do fitting and they'll move the atoms around in the model in such a way until you get a good agreement. So here the blue curve is a measured PDF of nickel, and the red curve is a calculated PDF of nickel, and the green curve is the difference. And we can get actually very good fit to well-known crystal And this is another very nice one for getting used to the PDF. So this is another very famous carbon material, it's C60. At 60 atoms, it's a hollow sphere of carbon atoms. And this is the scattering pattern from a, from a sample of C60. And this is the PDF, which is the free transform of that. And you see that first peak at 1.4 angstroms, it's the near neighbor peak. And the second peak is this one. And the third peak is diametrically across the hexagon. And then if you know what C60 is made of, it's made of hexagons and pentagons. So the pentagon, here's a pentagon here. The pentagon has the near neighbor distance, and it has the second neighbor distance, but it has no third neighbor distance. So intuitively, you look at the intensity of that third peak and the ratio of the intensity to the second peak, and you can, you can deduce ring statistics in your carbon material. You can tell how many five-member rings versus six-member rings. You can do that without even doing any modeling. You just look at the relative but if you have a structure model for your material, like C60, you can compute all of these peaks. And the last sharp peak is the, diam is the diameter. So I'm sitting on this atom, and I'm looking at that atom. It's exactly the diameter of the ball. And the ball is 7.1 atoms. And that last sharp peak there is exactly 7. That's a 6, and that's an 8. So that's a 7.1 angstrom. And then the PDF, which is just the Fourier transform of this data here, it just has these essentially no signal out here. So why is there no signal there? It's because I'm sitting on an atom on this buckyball, and I'm looking at an atom on that buckyball. And the data were collected at room temperature, and at room temperature, C60, the balls are dynamically reorienting. They're spinning like this at room temperature. And this smears out all of the atomic density on the surface of the balls on average. So the time average view of that is a smooth, hollow sphere of carbon. <laughs> and so it turns out that actually there is a little bit of structure out here. You see three peaks. And the peaks are telling you actually how these balls pack. So it turns out that the ball-ball separation is 10 angstroms. So there's peak at 10. And they form an FCC, face center qubit arrangement. So the second neighbor distance is root 2 times 10. Third neighbor distance is root 3 times 10. Root 2 times 10 is 14 point something. Root 3 times 10 is 17 point something. Okay, so actually these peaks here are telling you, these peaks down here are telling you how the atoms are arranged in the ball. And these peaks out here are telling you how the balls are arranged. Yeah. This one here. Yeah. So these peaks are very broad, they're not sharp, I guess, right? and I'll come back to that in a sec. But you see that this one is peaked at 10, and there's another peak here at 14 point something, and another one peaked at 17 point something. Now, the, these peaks come from the arrangement of the balls. So what you're doing is 
the pair, the pair distribution function, you're always sitting on one atom and looking at your neighboring atoms or your other atoms. So for these guys, we're sitting on an atom on this ball, and we're looking at an atom on that ball. But because of this dynamic reorientation, all of that atomic density is smeared out. So you just get a very broad peak like that. But it's peaked at the, at the ball ball separation. So these balls are 10 angstroms apart. That's why that's 10. And this is, this is FCC, so the second neighbor distance is, is root 2 times 10, and the third neighbor distance is root 3 times 10, so 14 and 17. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's an excellent point, yeah. So we, we have intramolecular correlation function which is the, how the atoms are arranged on the ball, and we have intermolecular correlation functions, which is how the balls are arranged. And in this particular case, there's a very clean separation because, the, because of this averaging at room temperature, these peaks are very broad out here, and these peaks are very sharp. Actually, if you take C60 and you cool it down to a very low temperature, it has, it has a phase transition, a freezing transition. The balls freeze at particular orientations, and we have data from that, and you get these sharp peaks out here. That has much more information in it, in principle, but it makes it much harder to extract the information. We have methods that we're starting to be able to do that for molecular materials. Okay. So, we're interested in nanomaterials. We want to use PDF to solve the nanostructure problem. So, I, I like to classify nanomaterials in three different ways, just to keep it clear to people. So this is the easiest one. This is a nanoparticle. It's an individual object that is nano-sized. This is the opposite of a nanoparticle. It's a nanoporous material. It's a bulk material, but it has nano-sized holes in it. These are also actually very important materials for application. And this one here is actually one of the most interesting. This is actually a nanostructured crystal. So this is a material which has <coughs> crystal, crystallographic long-range order. It's actually a beautiful crystal. But when you look at it with PDF, you look down in the local structure, you see this kind of tweed, tweed-like structure, like the, like the material. Um, and what's happening here is you have these nano-sized domains where the structure is modified from the average structure. And um, in the past, we, didn't, we neglected this. We didn't really know about it. So we made materials, we solved the crystal structure, and then we forgot about it. What's happening now is we're going back and we're looking at more and more materials. And it turns out that actually this nanostructure is really strong determinant for the properties. And we have to use PDF type methods or focus scattering methods to uh, understand them. Okay, I feel I should ask the question because it's already almost an hour, right? Yeah, I've gone much more slowly. I wanted to explain things. So, well, let me do another five minutes and we can decide what to do. So let me take you through this one example here of uh, doing PDF on nanoparticles. So we're going to look at individual objects that look like this. So it's cadmium selenide, which is a semiconducting quantum dot. And these are, um, I, we, I have three. I have a bulk material, so it's cadmium selenide bulk. Then I have cadmium selenide three, two, and one. And this is four nanometer diameter, three nanometer diameter, and two nanometer diameter. So these are different size nanoparticles. And this is the diffraction pattern over here. <coughs> so if you look at the diffraction pattern, the bulk material has very sharp peaks of fragments. And what happens to the diffraction pattern as you get to these small nanoparticles, and as the nanoparticles get smaller, these diffraction peaks get broader and broader and broader. So they get broader, they also get lower. They seem to scale. So that's characteristic of the finite size effect of small nanoparticles. Your diffraction peaks get broad. So we're going to take the data, Fourier transform it to get the PDF. And we look at the PDF, and something different happens in the PDF. If you look at this first peak here and you go down from the bulk all the way down to the nanomaterial, 
you see that peak stays beautifully sharp. So there's no peak broadening that happens in the PDF due to the, due to the finite size effect. But the place where you see the finite size effect is you see these ripples going out here. This is the structure, the structural mass. And for the crystalline material, it goes forever. And for the nanoparticles, you can see there's an envelope which kind of kills it. And so this one here, I can still see a signal out there, but it's getting weak. This one here, there's a signal, and it's kind of gone by 30. So this is my three nanometer diameter nanoparticle. There's no signal out after three. And this is my two nanometer diameter nanoparticle, and there's no signal after two, but there is signal below two. So the PDF, just even looking at it without, without doing any modeling, I can immediately tell you how big your nanoparticle is. We can also come up with structural models and we can fit them. So I showed this to you for the nickel case. The red line is the, is the structural model. The blue line is the measured data. This, this is the difference curve. And people always want to ask the question, there's two structures that, that these semiconductors can have. One is wood site and one is zinc blend. This is cubic, this is uh, rhombohedral or hexagonal. And so we ask the question, is our nanoparticle wood site or zinc blend? So if we look at the bulk material, the word site fits pretty well, and the zinc blend fits pretty badly. So we can say word site. Done. If we look at the nanoparticles, the situation is not quite so clear. Um, the word site fits okay, that's the difference curve. And the zinc blend kind of fits okay. Maybe this is slightly better, but you can't really answer it, so it looks like PDF has failed. It hasn't answered the question, is it wood site or zinc blend? So we do a little bit more investigation, and what we can do is we can put these different crystallographic parameters in. You'll get good at this with the practical. And we can put an anisotropic ADP, atomic displacement parameter, and we can allow this U33 to be uh, to change. And what we find is that this the values for these U parameters should be like this, 0 0.01, 0 0.02. These numbers are okay. 0.15, this is 10 times too large. It kind of implies that that atom is executing a, a thermal motion which is 10 times of normal. This is completely unphysical. It's completely wrong. So actually, we can go back and look what's the difference between these two structures. So these have a particular stacking along the c-axis direction in word side, which is, which is A, B, A, B, A, B stacking. So word side is A, B, A, B stacking. And zinc blend is A, B, C, A, B, C stacking. So what you can have in these materials is then defects. You can have a material that's zinc blend that goes A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, A. That was a mistake. That's a stacking fault. So um, these things can have stacking faults. And so what's actually happening here is actually these materials are heavily faulted. They have a large number of stacking faults. And when you have these stacking faults, then your crystal structure model is looking for an atom in a certain place along the C direction. It can't find it because of that stacking fault. And so what it does is it tries to remove the intensity from the pattern that comes from that correlation. And it does it by increasing this. So this is unphysical. But what we can do is we can make a model where we have the stacking faults in it. And when we have the stacking faults and we put this, we, we refine this U33 again, we get good numbers. And we can also refine a stacking fault fraction. Which is what's the probability of there being a fault? So it goes A, B, what's the probability of the next one being A or C? And we get very high numbers, like 50. I think these are overestimates. 50% means that as you go A and B, and there's a 50% probability of the next one being A or C. That means that these nanoparticle structures are completely confused. Like, they really don't know whether they're zinc blend or wood site. In fact, the distinction doesn't matter. And if you look at the size of the nanoparticle, what you see is that, in gen in, on average, you only have, like, four or five layers. And typically, you'll only have one stacking fault. It doesn't make any sense to actually differentiate between work site and zinc blend. But people still like to use their old crystallography. They can't, they can't get out of their old crystallography mindset.
Ya. Ya. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we're fitting we're fitting a wrong model. And the model has some parameters in it that allow it to mitigate that problem. So it uses them. But then what people will tend to do is they'll take this and they'll try and interpret it as a physical thing, but it's just an uh, incorrect model. So this is something that you always have to be careful about. And we always, we always look for this, because sometimes you get a good fit and you say everything's OK. You should always look at your numbers and make sure that they're physically reasonable, because if they're not, it probably means that there's something going on and it's something interesting. In other words, this boring result has turned into an interesting one, and the impact factor of the journal that you can submit to has gone from this low one to this high one. Yeah, we love it when things go wrong. So <clears throat> we can fit structural models to the nanoparticle. We can extract stacking fault defects. And we can measure the size of the nanoparticle. So we can, we can measure the size of it just by looking. but by using this function here, this is actually the characteristic function for a, for a sphere. So if we assume that the nanoparticle is spherical, we have an analytic mathematical form for its shape. And so we can actually multiply our model by that term there. And, it, and then it has one parameter, which is d, the diameter. So we can extract the diameter. We get very good values for the diameter. So we can get the structure. We can get the defects. We can get the size. And interestingly, these are tiny little three, two and three nanometer diameter nanoparticles, and we can measure strain. And what we do is, this peak here is the first peak in the PDF, it's the cadmium to selenium bond length. And it's at this distance here, and this is the bulk material, and this dashed line is through the center of it. And if you look very carefully, this is the four, three, two, and I've added another data set, which is 1.5 nanometer diameter nanoparticle. So the nanoparticle is getting smaller as we go down. And what you see is that this cadmium selenium bond shifts to the left, shortens. So there's a compressive strain, size-dependent compressive strain in these nanoparticles. And we can plot that here as a function of nanoparticle diameter. And you can see that it's a very large strain. It's like 10% strain in these 1.5 nanometer diameter particles. Um, and if you look carefully, I told you that the peaks in the PDF don't get broader as the nanoparticle gets smaller. That's not quite true. If you look very, very carefully, you can extract the width of these peaks as a function of nanoparticle size. And it does actually get slightly broader. But this is not a size effect. This is actually coming from the fact that there's a broader distribution of bond lengths in the small nanoparticle. And the reason is that you have some, some atoms are at the center of the nanoparticle, and some of them are near the surface. And there's no reason why those two atoms that have different environments would have the same bond length. So some of them will be longer and some shorter. You don't actually know wh whether the long bonds are in the middle or the long bonds are on the surface. You don't have actually a good enough structural model to tell that. But just looking at this peak width here, it tells you that actually the inhomogeneous strain is increasing with the nanoparticles increasing. Okay. So I think that's the place to stop um, and have a break or something. Um, but just to summarize, I just wanted to show also the, the importance of nanostructure, the, why it's difficult, and what we're doing about it. And this is one like beautiful example that I use a lot that shows you how you get different yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Termination ripples, right? On. Tiny little ones. And what you can see is actually <coughs> those the ripples are actually in the model as well. Yeah, so we're fitting, yeah. I mean, we don't, we're not actually fitting them because we know what QMAX we need, so we compute them. Yeah. People call them errors. They call them termination errors. They're not 
errors. Their, um, their truncation, their truncation signal, right? So they're coming from the fact that you've lost information. Like we, know, we know how to handle it. Um, okay, yeah, that's a great question. So, when you go to higher Q, you have better resolution in real space. So, if your scientific question demands high resolution, you should go to high Q. But if your scientific question does not demand high resolution, you don't have to go to high Q. So, I have one beautiful example that we've been working recently on pharmaceutical drugs. And we're often not going above 12 inverse lengths. Even we have a synchrotron. Very, very high. We're not, we don't bother. And it's because we're, in that case, we're mostly interested in the intermolecular correlation function, how these molecules act. And because it's, because there's only weak Van der Waals bonding between them, the signal itself is quite broad. And there's actually no benefit. To them. So if you pick the right problem, you can use a mod, uh, not so high cube. So yeah, but I mean we're we're well above atomic resolution. So the highest resolution measurements we do, we go up to Q max of 45. That's the conductor alloy, and we had a resolution of uh, 0.12 angstrom, just like a tenth of an angstrom. But yeah, you you want you know it's it's quite rare that you you know, you need to get to 12. So copper K-alpha is usually not going to do it, but a moly, a moly source, you can do a lot with a moly source, depending on your system, and with a hot source of any kind. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's basically a sampling thing. So it's, um, the resolution in real space is something like 2 pi over Q max. I'm not sure if that's the exact relation, but yeah, there may be a more exact, like five by three or something. But yeah, if that's what I that's rule of thumb. So that's all. Yeah, so the, the resolution is a tricky thing. The resolution is defined as the ability to differentiate two points. Okay? And that's a little bit of subjectivity in there. It depends on, you know, how, if, if they're overlapped and it's, it's a sheet that's not Gaussian shape, you can kind of resolve them with modeling. Yeah, but if I ever see that. Yeah, I think it's just a, uh, yeah, a few minutes and then, yeah. Yeah. Well, when do you have to go for lunch? Like, you had it as two hours all the way through, right? No, you're, you're the boss. You're the boss. You're in charge. Yeah. It's already 12. Right? I mean, I think we should just have, like, five minutes. I said, okay, we'll run our DFT program. We'll predict the structure. And this was their prediction. For the 20, this was a prediction for the 25, the prediction for the 38. Now, one of the most famous gold clusters of all is gold 144. This is a very, very stable cluster of gold. It has 144 gold atoms in it. And it's so stable that you can actually make powders of it, but a very small amount, like micrograms of powder. But it's like this black powder. And so, um, Hanu Hakkinen, who's a Finnish physicist, did a DFT uh, prediction of what the structure of this is. And it was a heroic effort because he actually 
did the calculation with the cluster covered by these organic ligands. So he had 144 gold atoms, he had 60 sulfur atoms, and he had uh, almost equal number of carbon, carbon atoms for the ligands. So it became a very large DFT calculation. But he succeeded and he predicted that the, the core of this gold cluster would have this icosahedral shape. So icosahedral is a shape that doesn't fill space. There are no crystal structures with this shape. But it's a very stable cluster for, for a finite cluster. So he predicted this icosahedral core. Now because this is such a stable gold cluster and we could get samples, we could measure PDFs. So we measured the PDF, we did this at the SRF, which is a synchrotron in France, and we got this blue curve. And we could compute the PDF from Hanu's predicted structure, and it's that black curve. And it doesn't fit that well, but maybe it just needs to be broadened and smooshed down. So we tried to turn this structure into the blue one here, but the red curve is the best that we could do by broadening peaks and so on. And it basically is, does a terrible job. There's a very strong feature here. It doesn't get right at all. It does a horrible job. So the DFT prediction was wrong. So that actually goes to show that DFT, as powerful of a, as a computational method as it is, it's not always getting things right. And you have to check it with experiment. So we started model building. and. There's really two ways that the crystal, the gold clusters go. They either go icosahedral way or decahedral. Decahedral is actually a close packed form. So the local arrangement. characteristic shapes which has a five-fold symmetry. So it's called a decahedron. And um, we get a, a rather good fit. So it's like, okay, <coughs> the DFT got it wrong, but we showed that it's a decahedral one. So we went back to Hanu and we said, this is what we think the core looks like. And Hanu said, <coughs> that can't possibly be correct. And the reason is that from a DFT perspective, this is energetically very unfavorable. And he was right. So he said that you have to have, on the surface of this, you have to have these, these they're called thiol staples. It goes gold, sulfur, gold, sulfur, gold. It's like a bridge. So they look like this. You can kind of see one here. There's this, this red is a sulfur. These are sulfurs, and that's a gold. So there's a gold on the core. It goes up to sulfur, across to this gold, which is hanging out at the side another sulfur and back down to gold. These are file staples. And these things are actually needed to energetically stabilize this object. So what we did is we went back and we said, OK, it has 144 gold atoms in it. Um, but we need to have 60 of those atoms involved in these file staples. So what we did is we made a close packed um, decahedral core of 114 atoms. Actually, no, it's 30, it's 30 golds in the plasma. 60 sulfurs, 30 gold. So 114 gold core, and then the other 30 golds we put in staples on the outside. And we also got a, a good fit. In fact, the fit was really comparable. So what that's telling you is that the PDF data on its own was not enough to solve the structure. And the DFT on its own was not enough to solve the structure. But the DFT plus the PDF together, we got, we got a much more, a much better structure solution. But that's an example where we basically solved the structure. Um, it's, I guess it's not fair. But this was actually published in Nature Materials. And the interesting thing that came out of this study was that we went back to repeat the experiment. And when we repeated the experiment, we got gold clusters that had the icosahedral core. So it turns out that this gold 144 can form either with a decahedral or an icosahedral core. In fact, it's polymorphic. So it's the first gold cluster that's 
discovered that's actually polymorphic. And we had some samples that was a mixture of it both. It's actually very interesting. It's such a small material, it's actually polymorphic. More than one structure. Um, another area that we've been applying this is 2D materials. So 2D materials are very important. Graphene is an example of a 2D material. But there's many more now that people are interested in, like molybdenum disulfide and niobium disalamide, and many, many that have interesting electronic properties. So these maxi materials, what you do is you start with this three-dimensional material, which has a metal and an aluminum, and then this X, this X phase is uh, something like nitrogen. And what you do is you treat it with HF, which is a very strong, kind of uh, etching material, and that removes the aluminum. Because of the layered structure that it had, the aluminum is all in some layer, you pull it out, what's left behind is this single layer material that's really like graphite. Um, and it has extremely good properties for things like battery electrodes and supercapacitors. So this is not our work. We're collaborating with Yuri Gagotsi, who's at Drexel University. But he had a problem of how to characterize these materials. Um, and so uh, what we were able to do with the PDF is actually determine what these layers were here and also how they're stacked along the C direction. Uh, let's see, do I have this here? So, okay, yeah, I can talk about it here. So, what we did is we did a model for one of these layers here. We did a crystal structure model, which looks like this. And we find that we get actually quite good fits down here. But starting up here in this high R region, the fit gets bad. In fact, the, the, the data from the, the model is much more suppressed than the, than the data from the, the material. And it turns out that the, this distance here is exactly the interlayer distance. And so again, this is the same problem that we had with the cadmium selenide, which is that the layers are becoming disordered, and we need a model where we just, we just model individual layers. So this is another material that we're looking at with A. Clearfield at Texas a and He's a chemist. And this material is a mixed organic inorganic material. And these layers here are inorganic layers and they're phosphates, so phosphorus oxide basically. And they're joined together, they form these layers, these layers like this, but they're held together by these organic materials. This is a phenol ring. So there's organic tethers that hold these things together, but the organics are kind of floppy. So again, these things slide over each other. And this is basically uh, Abe's, Professor Bluefield's idea of how it works, that you have these defects in here and it leaves voids. And what's a little bit magical about these materials is that they're highly selective for 3 plus ions. So if you have a 3 plus ion, uh, it will get trapped in this material, but if you have a 2 plus or a 4 plus ion, it won't. And nobody knows why the material has that selectivity. That selectivity is very important. Like, like people are interested in using this material actually for nuclear fuel reprocessing. And the, the key thing there is that you want to separate actinides and lanthanides. The actinides are radioactive byproducts of the nuclear uh, fission reaction, and the, and the lanthanides are not. You want to separate them. But they're very similar to each other chemically, and they're very similar to each other physically. It's very difficult to separate actinides and lanthanides. And this material shows great promise for that. Now, the problem that I ran into is that this is the powder pattern from a crystalline, purely inorganic material. But from his hybrid organic inorganic materials, the diffraction pattern looked like this. And again, this is what you're, whenever you're faced with a diffraction pattern that looks like this, you should think about using PDF. So these materials, they have a little bit of structure, very broad peaks, but they're nano-sized. So these particles of this material are extremely nano, and there's no way that you're going to solve the structure from this. But by doing PDF, we do this high Q measurement, and we get 
data that look like this. So this is a G of R versus R, and this is the, we get these beautiful sharp peaks, and it's now, it's the same sample as this one, just measured differently. Now we have a lot of information that we can fit to get the structure out. <laughs> and so we can try different candidate models for what the layers look like. And we can compare them, and actually this one is the one that seems to be fitting best. And so we actually get a model for what the layers look like. And then, as I mentioned, the layers are actually, we call it turbostratically disordered. It means that the, the layer is a well-ordered crystal or well-ordered material. The next layer is a well-ordered material, but they move with respect to each other. And so we need to come up with a model, a way of modeling where we don't have a 3D crystal structure, but we just have a slab of material. And we've been writing new software programs now that are able to do these finite size objects. So we were able to do it. So this is what the layer material looks like. And you can see the side, that, again, you see the peaks here, they extend out here and the signal is almost gone. So where the signal disappears here, that's the, that's the range that the layer is actually coherent over. So one possibility is that the material is made up of stacked sheets that are this size. <coughs> Another possibility is that these sheets these sheets are buckled and bent. And when they buckle and bend, we start basically start to get basically loose correlations, loose coherence. And so this is the size of the, the range of structural coherence. So we can get this nice layer structure and the coherence length. Once we have that, we can build up more three-dimensional models like this, and we can start getting a much better understanding of what the real structure of these materials is. Now something else that we've been pushing very hard on is the sensitivity of the measurement. So sometimes you have a nanoparticle that's embedded in something else, maybe a nanoparticle inside glass or something like that. <clears throat> and people would ask us, what's the smallest amount of material that, that you can measure? And we used to say always, well, if, if there's 5% of material, we can see it. If there's 1% of the material, we're not so sure. But we've been working very hard to increase the sensitivity and so by using, by collecting data with very high statistics and then using some advanced data processing methods, computational methods, we're actually doing much better. And so this was a project which demonstrates this. It's actually a collaboration with GlaxoSmithKline, which is a pharmaceutical manufacturing company. And this is Matt Johnson from GSK. This is uh, um, Max my student who was working on this, and this is to be my scientist at ESRI for Marco. Um, and basically, <clears throat> what we did is, so GSK has this um, nebulizer drugs. It's, a, it's, um, it's an inhaler. And what you do is, it, it comes in one of these things and you inhale like that, it goes into your lung. And they have the drug there that's it's, it's treating asthma, basically, but it has to be nano-sized. So they take the drug material and they make it into a small nano-sized particle. And this is extremely important because when it gets in your lung, it has to get to the alveoli in, in your lung. So there are these structures on the surface of your lung. And if the, if the, drug, is too, if the drug particle is too large, it can't get to the place it needs to get to, so they have to make it small. But the problem is if you have an amorphous or a nanostructured drug, you have to characterize it. How do you characterize it? You'll give, some patient is going to take this drug. You'd better be giving them what you think you're giving them. So this is where we came in. We said, okay, we're going to do PDF on this. So we, so we told Matt to, to bring a series of samples, but we said we, we need a high concentration of this material because the PDF is not so sensitive. So he brought them, and these are the different samples inside these capillary tubes, and they're loaded in a sample changer. <clears throat> and you can see that there, some of them have very high concentrations, but the ones which had very high concentration, what happened is it precipitated out. So actually it was such a high concentration, it didn't stay in suspension, it precipitated out. And then just for the heck of it, he brought some low concentration ones. So this one here is actually the dose form. It's actually the same concentration as you get in the, in the drug that's on the market. 
So we can do a measurement of the, <coughs> this is the signal from the drug itself. So this is actually a dry crystallized powder of the material. So that's the signal from the drug. This is the signal from the liquid the solvent that it's suspended in. So the solvent is structured. It's water, but it has some other things in it. And you can see these peaks down in the low R region, below 10, and then it's flat. Now, we get very high reproducibility. So what you can see is a green curve and a blue curve here. And they're, they're even, the, even the tiny little ripples are reproduced, basically. And these come from the, I don't remember which way around it is, but one of them is coming from the dry crystalline control sample we had. The other one is coming from the material that was precipitated out of solution. So it was made into high concentration and precipitated out. And you can see that the material precipitated out is the same as the, as the control. And this is the level of reproducibility that our measurement has. So we're very confident that we're really measuring the drug. Then what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at the drug in suspension. So we start then, then looking at, at, at lower and lower concentrations. So the green curve, um, so it says that the blue is the PDF of the crystalline API, and the green is 5 weight percent. Um, but it looks like it may be the other way around. But the point is that the green and the, there's a bit more noise now, but the green and the blue curve you can still see the signal there. So even at five weight percent of API in aqueous solvent, we're seeing, we're seeing it. But then we went to the samples that we, that we had brought that were the, the regular ones. So the red one is the five weight percent of API. Then there's a green one is 0.66 weight percent, and the blue is 0.25 weight percent. And you can see that although the signal is getting much more noisy, definitely recovering the signal down here. So this showed us that using these new computational methods and, and the best quality data, we can actually get extremely high sensitivity. So it's 0.25 weight percent, and it's an organic in water. So an organic is made of carbon. It's a low atomic number, weakly scattering material. So we were basically astounded. We, I didn't believe this result, but I could not believe it because it's true. So we're now able to look at very, with very high sensitivity as well as um, looking at small size things. And that allows us to do very interesting things because we can look at precursors. For example, this was a, a collaboration with uh, David Cliffel at Vanderbilt. And <clears throat> he's making gold nanoparticles in solution. And he actually wanted to look at not the gold nanoparticle, the product, he wanted to look at what the precursor was. So you dissolve these reagents in the, in the liquid, and what form do they take? And different possibilities are they form these chains. Again, this is gold, sulfur, gold, sulfur, gold, sulfur. So sulfur is really important in this gold chemistry. But then you could also have these kind of rings, and there's a very particular ring called an um, orophilic ring, which looks like this. And actually what we could show is that the this orophilic ring is actually what the precursors look like in solution. Once you know this, you can start thinking about what reaction pathways are for, for the nanoparticle synthesis. Once you have that idea, you can try and do an in situ synthesis. So what you can do is you can take a reactor and it has reagents in it, and then you flow the reagents through a tube, and then you bring the synchrotron beam in to the side put it through the tube, and you can do a time resolved measurement of the, uh, of the synthesis of the material in real time. So this is a hydrothermal synthesis, it's a collaboration with Bo Wrightson in August. So we often collaborate, we're basically the scattering experts, and we collaborate with people who have their own expertise, and this is how a lot of our work gets done. So we put this reactor into the beam, and then we want to follow the synthesis and we've done it on a number of different systems, tin oxide nanoparticles, cerium nanoparticles. Um, in the case of the tin oxide, it was actually very interesting that we, <coughs> the precursor looked like this. So it was basically tin, and it's surrounded by four chlorines and two hydroxyl groups. So this is oxygen here. 
And it, it comes actually in different forms with, with either four, four chlorines or three chlorines. But we had to have a way of computing the PDF of this discrete object. And again, we needed to use our latest software uh, to do that. But, but this, is the, this blue curve is what this precursor PDF looks like. And the green curve is what the resulting tin oxide looks like. And what we can do is we can fit a two-phase model of just the, of the tin oxide product and this precursor, and we get this kind of fit. So you can see this is the, the, these are the signals from the blue, and then the rest is the green. And what we can do is then we can follow the synthesis as a function of time, and we see how the reagents decrease in time, and how the products increase in time, like this. And then you can extract reaction kinetics out. And what was rather surprising was actually only, only say, 40% of the reagent was used up. Most of the reagent wasn't used. And uh, the reason for that is actually, again, coming back to this thing that it turned out that there's different forms of this cluster in there with different number of chlorines, and only one, one form of it was actually involved in the reaction, and the rest was not. So you can learn from that that actually if you can make all of your reagents be this form, then you can get much higher yield. In the case of uh, yttria stabilized zirconia, it was even more interesting. So you take the reagents and you dissolve them in the water. And actually what happens in that case is that the reagents, again, it's this metal ion in the middle of, a, in the middle of an octahedron. And the metal ion is what is the is the um, zirconium, um, and it's but it doesn't just float around like a single octahedron. So in this one, you had a peak here, which was this center to the edge, and a peak here, which is the edge to the edge, and that's it. You only have two peaks because it's a single octahedron. What we found here is that we had those peaks that we could see, but we also had these higher peaks. What this means is actually that the precursor reagent is polymerizing inside the solution. So it's forming something that looks like this. The best fit we can get to the data is this work with Kristen Jensen, who's a postdoc of mine, or former postdoc. And the best fit we could get was a model where we have these dimers that polymerize into this chain, and they have a kind of a 10 angstrom coherence length. We don't actually know if they're clusters this size or whether they're larger objects that are bent. But we can extract this much at least from that. And so that's at the very beginning of the, uh, essentially before the reaction starts, that's what we see. And in the next period, what we see is actually these, these peaks start to disappear and we get something that looks actually like amorphous material. And so what we think is happening is that these these objects here, these polymerized objects, the dimers are coming off the object, and then the dimers are fitting together to make the product. And there's more than one way that they can fit together. So to form the perfect crystal structure, they all have to clip together in exactly the same way. But they come off and they just find a neighbor and they pair with the neighbor, and they make mistakes. So then when they start coming together to form larger objects, it can't propagate the, the correct structure over long range. So it basically forms an amorphous, so the thing forms very, very rapidly, this amorphous intermediate. And then finally, a little bit later here, you see these peaks start coming up, and the thing is actually producing the product, the um, yttria stabilized zirconia. And so some kind of crystalline material is forming in the, in the middle of the amorphous and it's kind of growing out. And there's some chemistry that we can get, so we can actually look at the zirconium zirconium distance as a function of the diameter of the crystallite, and we see that it's changing continuously like that. So there's some chemistry that's going on at the same time as this thing is actually recrystallizing. And I'm not a chemist, so I don't really understand the significance of that, but it's just showing you the kind of detailed information that we can get about synthesis happening in real time. So once we had the idea that we had very good sensitivity, we could see very weak signals in some, some materials. Um, we said, let's try and do thin film PDF. 
So what we can do here is we can take a we can take a, a substrate and we can lay down a film on top. And the film will be some nanomaterial, but it's very, very thin. And we just come in with the X-ray beam and we go through the substrate and through the film and we collect the diffraction pattern. Now the signal from the from the substrate is much stronger than the signal from the film, but because we have this sensitivity, we can do it. And so this is an example here where the red curve is the substrate and the black curve is the film. And they lie basically on top of each other. But there's a tiny little signal and difference curve. And when we blow that signal up, we get actually a real signal, which is just coming from the film. So a more challenging one, this was where the film was crystalline, a more challenging one is where you've got an amorphous substrate with an amorphous film on it. And that was this case here, and this is the signal we got. And we Fourier transform this signal to get the PDF, and we get the um, red curve over here. And to check whether we weren't just measuring rubbish, what we did is we took many of these films and we scraped the film off the substrate and we harvested the powder and we put the powder in a capillary and we measured the capillary using regular PDF and that's the black curve. So the, the, <clears throat> the film that was scraped off and put into a capillary and we, we did it from like, like many, many films to get enough material is, is black. And the one that's actually measured just by going through the film is in red, and you can see that we're actually measuring it beautifully. So we're now doing thin film PDF, and the, the thinnest film that we've managed to measure is 70 nanometers thick, so less than 100 nanometers thick film. So that's an exciting development. How much will the measuring time? Um, so typically it'll be something of the order of 10 minutes of synchron. Actually, again, it depends on the thickness of the substrate and the scattering power of the film. But the substrate is glass? So, in this case, um, it was some amorphous thing, I don't remember what it was, but we, the one I said where we did 70 nan nanometers was actually we were measuring ITO on the glass slide. So it was a, a 4 millimeter thick glass slide with a 70 nanometer thick indium tin oxide film on it. We could get the ITO beautifully. So it's like pretty amazing. Now, let's say you only have nanograms of material. What do you do? So, what we were able to do in that case was actually we put it in an electron microscope. So, it's basically a laboratory microscope, and you, you take the material. Uh, yeah, it's easy to see here. So this is a standard microscope sample support. It's called a holy carbon film. So it's kind of a thin web-like film of glassy carbon. And we drip some gold nanoparticles in solution on there, and we let the solvent evaporate. And so these tiny dots on here are actually gold nanoparticles, and we can image them in the TEM. But then we can change the conditions of the electron microscope. So instead of imaging, instead of on the, in the detector plane doing the image, we put the diffraction uh, plane at the, at the detector. So we collect the diffraction pattern. So this is actually a diffraction pattern from this guy. And we extract the PDF in the usual way, so we get the power pattern here. And the red curve here is the diffraction pattern from the EP, the electron microscope for these gold nanoparticles. And this is a diffraction pattern for different gold nanoparticles measured with x-rays. We couldn't do the same measurement on the same particles, but you see that the, you know, the signal is, is being reproduced quite well. There's a slight difference in lattice parameters. So then we Fourier transform it to get the PDF, and the PDFs are here. So this is the gold nanoparticles measured with x-rays. Blue is the measure, the red is the calculated from this crystal structure model. Green is the difference curve. And here it is for EPDF. So actually, <coughs> there's a lot of issues with dynamical scattering. The electrons are very strongly interacting. You have to worry about dynamical scattering. But we can get actually pretty quantitative PDFs from the electron microscope. 
And that's actually very interesting for two reasons. One is that we can look at really nanograms of material, but the other is that actually a lot of university departments will have actually an electron microscope, whereas they won't necessarily have a synchrotron. Um, this is another thing where people would always come up to me at the meetings and say, well, wow, that PDF is really great, it's good, but um, can, you, uh, can you study magnetism? Can you get magnetic structure? So the goal here is to actually get magnetic short range order. And we actually just did this very recently with my graduate student, Ben Franzen, so NPDF or magnetic PDF. And it turns out it's very interesting. So the theoretical development was to develop the equation for magnetic PDF. And then we can compute it, and you can look at different magnetic structures. So this magnetic structure is a spin chain. So basically, it's a, it's a made-up one. It's a one-dimensional thing where, where there's basically ferromagnetic correlations between neighbors, but there's this modulation that makes it go antiferromagnetic with some longer wavelength. So it's some beautiful spin chain. And the way that the, the, the NPEF equations work is that there's a <coughs> When you have two spins separated by some distance, you get a very strong positive peak if it's a ferromagnetic correlation, and you get a negative peak if it's an antiferromagnetic correlation. So this guy, at one, at one angstrom here, these guys are ferromagnetically correlated. These guys are at one angstrom, they're ferromagnetically. These guys are ferromagnetically, these guys are ferromagnetically. But if you sit on this atom and look at that atom, this atom and that atom are anti-ferromagnetically correlated, right? And so this one is this guy here, let's say four or five. So, so the NPEF gives you nearest neighbor ferromagnetism and then far neighbor anti-ferromagnetism. This funny baseline is actually real, and it's that also useful, but um, it's coming from the NPEF equations. But you can straightforwardly compute the NPDF from different structures. This one is this one is some anti-ferromagnetism, um, and actually, uh, yeah. So basically, we know how to compute them. This one is a very interesting one, which is a spin ice on a pyrocore. So a pyrocore lattice is one which has a very high degeneracy, and the magnetic spins get confused. So it's like it's a geometric frustration. So if you have antiferromagnetic spins and you go around a triangle, you go up, down, and then the third one in the triangle is correlated with both of these. It can't decide whether to be up or down. So we say it's frustrated. <clears throat> so that's frustrated magnetism. And the pyrocore lattice doesn't have triangles, it has tetrahedra. But the same thing happens with tetrahedra. And then it follows actually spin ice rules. So the, the uh, uh, falling Pauling spin ice rule. This Pauling ice rule is actually obeyed in this spin ice. But we can actually compute what the correlations are from a model of this. So this is actually a very beautiful uh, thing. And I don't have examples in this talk. I'll show you maybe some later. But we can actually measure this very beautifully from data. And what you can see is you can see short range magnetic correlations even when there's no long range order. And so I think this might be the last example um, in this part of the talk, I'm not sure. But now that we can do very high throughput measurements, we can measure data in just a few seconds or even less than a second, we can start thinking about doing some very fancy things. So we combine um, PDF with computed tomography. So computed tomography is if you go to a hospital and you have a CT scan, they basically put an x-ray machine over here and they put a detector over there and they take an image of your body at this angle and then they rotate it and they take an image at this angle and rotate it, rotate it, rotate it. They take images at every angle and at each angle they're seeing, you're seeing the, what your body looked like um, in projection at that angle. So they'll end up with a thousand data sets at, each, at, at all angles and you can do this this tomographic back projection where you take those thousand projection images and mathematically you recompute what the cross-section of your body looked like. Um, 
So that's a very standard thing. It's computed tomography. So that's what we're doing here. But what we do is we we have an object. This is actually a catalyst body. So it's it's uh, if it's stabilized alumina, porous material, and sitting on top of it is palladium nanoparticles. They're very tiny. And what we do is we have a synchrotron down here, so our synchrotron beam comes up here, and our detector is back here. So we get the diffraction pattern, which is uh, relevant for this position. And then we go move across, and we get this position, this position, this position, this position. So we do a line scan of 100 points. And then we take this and we rotate it 2 degrees. And then we do it again, a line scan of 100. 2 degrees, line scan of 100. So we end up with roughly 100 by 100 data sets, so 10,000 data sets. And each data set is a complete diffraction so pattern. So the resolution and the material? So the resolution depends on the size of your beam. And so we were doing, in this experiment, 40 micron resolution, but we can do smaller. Um, so we run it through the uh, tomographic reconstruction, so instead of Instead of 10,000 data sets, which are the <coughs> average projection, average through some projection, we end up with 10,000 pixels. Now, this pixel is red, and this one's yellow, and this one's blue. And these colors represent numbers, so scalars. So most tomograms you see are basically scalar maps. They're maps of numbers. Um, but instead, we have a, this is a vector for us. We don't just have a single number in this pixel. We have a complete PDF inside that pixel. And inside this pixel, we have a complete PDF. So what we can do is we can actually fit the structural model to the PDF in this pixel, and this pixel, and that pixel. And so we can actually do a spatially resolved measurement of what the local structure is inside a bulk material like this. So it's pretty amazing. So we, this is what it looked like. This is a catalyst body, and these these catalysts were held inside thick glass tubes, and that was so that we could pass gases over them. So we we pass hydrogen to reduce it, and then oxygen to oxidize it. But when we when we did the measurement, there's no signal from the glass in any of these pixels. So even though there was a very thick container. There's no, we basically removed the, the CT reconstruction, the tomographic reconstruction removes the signal from the container. So it actually now allows us to do, as long as the beam can get through okay, we can do measurements inside really nasty containers and we get a nice clean signal without having to subtract the background because the CT takes care of it. So this is actually the glass tube that this thing was sitting inside. And then you can do nice things with batteries, for example. So this is a nickel metal hydride rechargeable battery. And it turns out if you cut those open, they have this nice spiral wound. So they basically take a, a, a cathode, electrolyte, anode sandwich like that, and you kind of roll it up into a jam, like a jam roll. And what we can do is we can, this is just kind of electron density measurement, but we can, we can fit, we can find the pixels which contain the cathode material, and we can fit the structure of the cathode, and we can see it here. And we can do the anode, which is here. The anode is much thinner than the cathode. And we can look for the signature from steel. And steel is actually, the, the battery was encased in steel. But interestingly, we can also see this spiral, uh, kind of dashed line. It turns out that there's a steel mesh that the anode is mounted on. So we can see the steel mesh inside. And then we can also look for polymeric material. So we can look for polymer. And this is a polymer. And this polymer is actually in the same place where the cathode is. And that's because actually the cathode material is bound, like glued together by polymeric material. So it's actually very exciting, and I think that this is going to really become important uh, moving forward. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I live in New York City, and New York City is 
kind of fashion capital of the world. One of them is also Paris and Madrid and Mumbai, for all I know. So, um, one of the big trends, certainly around 2015 and probably still now, is that of hipsters. So, if you guys heard of hipsters, hands up if you know what a hipster is. Okay, no one knows what a hipster is, either that or everyone's too shy. So a hipster is a fashion person, but it's a very special kind of fashion person. This is a photo of a hipster. So if you're a guy, you have a grill cream in your hair, so you look like the 1915 guy. And you have a beard like this. And of course you have a cell phone. But um, you, you, uh, yeah, you dress in this very kind of characteristic way like this. And so this for me was really funny because I told you in 1915 all the materials were natural and we wanted to do material science to make synthetic materials. And then pitch the man in a uh, hundred years later everything is uh, everything is natural but it's also organic. So that's the guy and he so in the neighborhood in New York City where I live is in Brooklyn and it's called Williamsburg and Williamsburg is the hipster capital of New York City so when I go out of my front door I'm surrounded by people who are looking like this all right so that's the end of the overview here so I don't have to really summarize because I've said it all but there's actually two books that are quite helpful. I don't know how easy it is for you to get access to these, but this one here is a book that I co-wrote with Takeshi Yagami, my thesis advisor. It's called Underneath the Brag Peaks, but it's basically a reference book for PDF. It's quite, it's quite complete. It's, it's not an introductory book, but it's, got, it's very complete. And more generally about powder diffraction, there's this book here, which is powder diffraction theory in practice, which is also um, uh, co-edited by me and Robert Dinebier, who's a, who's a chemist in Germany. And um, this one has more introductory material, uh, and this one is a little more in-depth material. But these are both good resources, especially chapter one of this one, which is on the powder diffraction method and uh, in chapter 16 or 13 or something is the PDF something. So, yeah. So we, have, we can have questions or queries or comments. So regarding the thing, you know, we can scrap the material also? Say again? Regarding the thing, you know, XRT button? Yeah. We can scrap the data only? No, no, we can, so that was the point is that we don't have to scrape. Now that we can do it without scraping. No scraping. Yeah, no scraping. That's the proof. Yeah, so that's the main result is that we can now do it without scraping. Uh, we could always do it, we could always scrape the floor, but now we can do it without scraping. The ideal film was amorphous? It was crystalline. It was crystalline. Yeah. And then we had an amorphous film on top of that. I thought the idea would be too thin, we wouldn't see it. So we have to like, very carefully measure the background. So if we have an idea of film and another film on top, and we're interested in the film on top, we have to actually subtract very carefully the idea as well as the cell shape. Sometimes these flips are grown on uh, silica, uh, I mean, silicon substrates. Yeah. So will it make it uh, easier? No, that makes it very hard for us. So if the, if the substrate is crystalline, crystalline. yeah, we have a single crystalline. Yeah, so in principle, you know, so we're we're thinking about, you know, I think that we might be able to figure out how to subtract the single crystal substrate, but it's so much easier to do with the amorphous one that we would much rather you're going to get superior results if, if the, you know so there's always this thing where you know we tell the chemists to make it this way and they want us to measure it that way <clears throat> and you have to find the best the best place but a, a lot of times they're okay with it we can't do epitaxial films anyway because we need a disordered film we need a power 
or a nano. So, so the place where this is going to be useful is if you have a, a thin polycrystalline film or a thin film of nanomaterial. Well, you can see the power of PDF analysis. And you can see how powerful this technique is. And Professor Blinch is also known as the PDF man. If you <laughs> see on internet some of his presentations. I didn't know that. That's not told me. So we stop here and uh, we will begin again for the last lecture for today. That is at 2.30. So I have a couple of other announcements. Uh, participants who have still not registered kindly first do it on the Gyan website and then you can register here in the information desk. So we now break for the lunch and the lunch for the participants who are staying in the guest house is arranged in the guest house. So you can proceed and then come back at 2.30. Yeah, and one more thing. Uh, please bring your laptops. I hope you... Um. But there's fairly good research that shows that it's very difficult to learn just from lectures. So we have to have some other activities uh, that help you to learn. <coughs> um, and what we do in, the in my classroom at uh, Columbia is that we do classroom discussions. So as the week goes on, we may do some of these in, in here. And the other thing that we do is that we work on things together in groups so i don't have the list of people yet but what i have is i have a software program that will take a list of people and randomize it and place you into groups so that actually you'll be in different groups and then at all we have to do it in a way where so the groups will be numbered like one through ten or one through twelve or something and we have to maybe put numbers where they are so that people know which number to go to. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> you, actually, you actually learn much better when you work in groups and in teams. And when, uh, when I start doing this with my Columbia students, they're usually not very good at it. So I have to teach them how to work in a team. Um, so we might do a little bit of that too, but we'll see. Maybe you guys are good at it. Um, and then there are a few um, uh, assignments. So each day there's an assignment, and I hope that it's not too much. We have to see. So what will happen is each day there'll be some lectures in the morning. Then there'll be some kind of practical session that will last for one hour or one and a half hours. And that's when we're doing... Uh, that's when we're doing um, these, this hands-on work and mostly so there'll be a little bit of lecturing like me showing stuff but mostly hopefully it will be you trying to do stuff and having problems and then me trying to help you and if many people are having the same problem I can show I can describe it on the stage so that, that will be one aspect and the other thing is that there's a very exciting development that I think is that um, actually together with my group members we're working on a book now the book is I already wrote one book about PDF it's the the blue book that I showed this morning it's underneath the Bragg Peaks but that's very much like a reference book it's not really teaching you how to do PDF and so this book here we call it PDF to the people and it's really supposed to be a way to help new people who want to start doing PDF how to do it and you're the first firstly the book is only half written and secondly you're the first people to get to try it out so it's not it still needs some proofreading and everything is not finished and some parts are less finished than other parts but I thought it would be still good to give you the book and then get your feedback about how helpful it is to help you learn. And so actually, 
what will happen is that in the assignment each day there'll be some reading from the book and then um, in each chapter of the book there's actually some kind of questions and uh, we'll see if you can answer the questions but it shouldn't don't 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 stay up all night trying to cover everything I mean just do as much as you feel comfortable doing and when you're answering the questions you can write things but keep it brief we have to figure out how to what to do with it when they've written stuff at all but yeah uh, <clears throat> yeah so yeah PDF to the people and um, so you can read all this this is the contents of the part that's written and that you have and so the first chapter is an introduction and overview so one part of your assignment today is to read this chapter and the next chapter is um, a PDF primer and so your job is also to read this chapter so neither of them are too long I think it's straightforward and it's everything I covered in the talk um, and then I think what we'll do each day is hand out assignments and I don't know how many of these you have do you have Do you have just assignment one or you have them all? These are ready, but we have to distribute. Yeah, so but they have, do they have number one? Yes or no? We have assignment one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, okay. So assignment one, it's kind of too small to see on here, but it says read chapter one of PDF to the people. Read chapter two of PDF to the people and what does that say uh, yeah write short answers to all the the questions posed in class so actually we didn't get to any of those because I didn't get to my second lecture so your assignment for today is quite straightforward it's just a reading assignment except that I have also one other worksheet um, which do they have this worksheet Okay. Um, I have to find it.
So <coughs> the worksheet looks a little bit like this. So sometimes when we learn conceptual things, we do it a lot by discussing it, discussing concepts with each other. But when you have to do derivations and you have to understand mathematics and how it relates to physics, this is uh, actually almost best done by actually kind of going through the derivation itself. But what many people don't realize about derivations is that there's a, there's a maths part and there's a physics part. And it's important to understand them both. So just being able to do the maths is not enough. And just having some hand-waving way of doing the physics is not enough. You want to do them both. So the way that I try and teach that to my students is that I'll take some derivation and there's some logic and there's some maths. And I'll either leave the logic and they have to fill in the maths. Or I'll leave the maths and they have to fill in the logic. So this uh, worksheet here is one for scattering, conservation laws and scattering. And this is one where I've um, removed the maths. So there's going to be some logic here. The law of conservation momentum states that the total momentum of a closed system, blah, 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 right? This is the logic. This is physics stuff. And then a mathematical expression for conservation momentum for this situation is this. So I've actually seeded it with one mathematical equation. And then if you go down, you'll see the rest of the mathematics is missing. So it says rearranging so the initial and final states are on the same side of the equation, we get blah. And you guys have to fill it in. Okay. Now, <clears throat> some people are very, some people have seen it before, some people have never seen it before, some people are much better at mathematics than other people. I don't know how you all are. So again, we try and do this in groups when I do it with my students. So we'll split you into groups of four people and you can work together. And sometimes it's good to work together because <clears throat> if you do know it, it's different. It, it's much harder to explain it. To, it's okay to know it yourself, but if you have to explain it to someone else, you get a different understanding of it. And if you don't know it, having someone explain it to you, especially somebody who's a peer, not a professor, can be very helpful. So that's why I like it to you to do it in groups. But we don't have the groups set up today, so you can just form, form your own groups and fill it in. Okay? Um, so you have the assignment number one. It's some reading. There'll be, this will be handed out, or it has been handed out, and you should fill that in. And the last thing is to just, we're going to just get started on the software. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly go through this, and it take me five minutes. And if you are able to follow, then you should be able to do this yourself. And what we'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll have you see if you can. So don't, don't try and follow along now, but as soon as I finish, try and reproduce everything here. So the PDF GUI program is for modeling PDFs. So the starting point is that we assume that you've obtained a PDF. You've done an experiment. You've done the data reduction and you have a PDF file. And the files have some file name and the extension is .gr, gr for g of r, which is the, the, the PDF, the letter for the PDF. Now the PDF GUI software, it has a nice GUI. Um, and just to get you um, familiar with the GUI, so it looks like this, and it has a main panel and then it has two sub panels here. And then this is an output panel. And all these panels can be actually detached. You, you, can, you can grab this bar with your mouse and you can drag it and you can rearrange it. Um, 
but the key thing is that <coughs> this panel down here is for controlling plotting this panel up here is uh, where we build our fits and then this is all the metadata or the data associated with the fit so what's a fit a fit is when we have one or more data set and one or more structural model so the simplest fit is one data set one pdf and one structure model and we're just fitting that structure model to that pdf but in principle you could have a sample which had a mixture of two different types of material in it in that case your fit would be two structure models and one data set you can also actually have multiple data sets. You could have an X-ray data set and a neutron data set, and, but you're trying to, it's from the same sample, which is made of one material, then you would have two data sets, one model, and of course you can have any number of data sets, any number of models, but whenever you're fitting something all together, that's considered to be a fit. And this fit tree here shows you all the fits that you've set up. So sometimes there's going to be one fit, but sometimes there's going to be multiple fits. If you've done temp taken temperature dependent data, you have 100 data sets at different temperatures. Each one is going to be a separate fit. Now, whatever is shown, here there are three tabs. And <clears throat> what appears over here in these panels is context dependent. So what's going to happen is over here, you see, see something in your fit tree is going to be highlighted. And what appears over here is going to depend on what thing in your fit tree is highlighted. Okay, so if you get confused when you start working on it and you can't find what you're looking for, it may be that you've highlighted the wrong thing in the fit tree. And uh, the same is true of the plotting. Okay. Um, up here is the toolbar and this has things this thing looks like a gear wheel that makes your fit run this thing that looks like a plot that plots your data um, this thing here when you've got something running that will turn red and if you press that it will stop the thing running although it can only stop it at certain breakpoints in the program so usually you want to stop something because you because it's taking too long and you may still have to wait for it to stop So this is an example where we have uh, this symbol here means that this is a data set. So this is a fit is made up of a structural model and a data set. And if I highlight the data set, then what I see over here are parameters that are relevant to the data set. So it we, we have to tell the program whether it was a neutron or an X-ray measurement the data range here um, and we this one is grayed out because you can't change the data range that's the range of the data but this one here the fit range can be adjusted then these are actually fitting parameters that the program will use but they're fitting parameters that are actually relevant to the data so this Q we'll discuss it more later but Q damp and Q broad are related to the instrument resolution function of your instrument. So they're data related parameters, not structure model related ones. So that's why I'm saying like if whatever's selected here, this is a data set selected. So everything over here is data related. Okay, that's not relevant. Live PDF GUI demo. Okay, <clears throat> so I have the old version of PDF GUI, which is uh, um, some of you will have the new version. It's better if you have the new version, but here it is. And what we're going to do is we're, I haven't really talked that much about PDF fitting, so I thought I would leave that for tomorrow. I just wanted to show you how to navigate around the program. So we start the program and it looks like this. 
And the first thing you have to do is you have to give the program something to do. So you have to give it uh, something, you have to create a fit. So always the first thing you do is you create a fit. So I want a new fit. So I can, these things here all have drop down menus. And since it's something to do with a fit, it's a new fit. We could do control, is that T? We could try control T. Yeah, and now we want to give the fit a name, so we'll call it um, we'll call it first fit, um, and what we want to do is we want to actually load a structure. So. Uh, the structures are actually called phases in this program because they're the different phases in your sample. And we want to introduce a new phase. Now we have two choices. We can load it from file or we can create it from scratch. Now loading from file is definitely much easier and most structures you'll do that. And it supports common structure types like CIF, CIF, files and PDB files for the protein data bank and so some common structure formats are supported and you would just have to you say okay uh, load a structure from file you'd go to open and it gives you a navigator and you'd navigate to your file and it will filter for these so it's filtering for either a CIF file or a PDF fit structure file which has dot strew uh, PDB file you can also give it files that contain X, Y, Z parameters in Cartesian coordinates. So if you wanted to do a glass model, that would be the way that you would load it. Okay, but we're not going to do that. So we're going to create a model from scratch. So what we're given is we're given a empty, essentially, structure now and PDF GUI is, although we're doing PDF fitting, we uh, are assuming that it's a fairly well-ordered material and so we can use a, something like a crystal structure model to express it. This seems like a very strict constraint, but actually it turns out you can do really a lot uh, even with this constraint and I'll show you some things later. But any crystallographic model, it has a unit cell where you have an A lattice parameter, a B lattice parameter, and a C lattice parameter. And then alpha, beta, gamma are the angles of, your, of the axes of your unit cell. These things here, don't worry about for now, we'll get back to these. So you need to know the data and um, I'm going to have to figure a way to get these to the students at all, but um, what I have is Um, yeah, I'll show you the data right now. All right, so so inside, what what I'll do is I'll give you everything in this directory. Um, now these are actually these are actually examples that you can work through if you like, which we use during tutorials. There'll be some redundancy too. And these are actually the chapters of the book. Okay. Now let's look inside. Uh, so if we, the, the simplest one is structure of nickel. So you'll get this. And if we look in the GR file, this contains the data. And it's basically a text file. Uh, I have too many things open and this window's too... Okay, I don't know how to do it. Okay, let's try opening it with... Uh... Oh. Open with JEdit.
So our, our GFR files, these are produced by our other programs that do the data reduction. And what we like to do is we like to save a lot of metadata in the top of the file. And that's because when you do the data processing, you do things to the data. And this is some kind of record of what was done to the data. But this stuff you can pretty much skip over. And if you go all the way down, then this is where the data starts. And what's given here is actually what's in each column. So this has R in the first column, G of R in the second column, D of R and D of G of R. This is the uncertainty in D of R and this is the uncertainty in G of R. Now I don't know where these numbers came from, like there's really no uncertainty in, in R. So only goodness knows what these numbers mean, but they're just going to be ignored by the software. So the software will read this one for the R, 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 mate, R vector and this one for the G vector. But you can always open them in a text editor and you can look at them. Yeah, you can give two columns. And I think if you give three columns, it assumes that, the, that it's R, G of R and D, G of R. And if you give four columns, I think it assumes that it's R, G of R, D, G, D, O, R, and D, G of R. So, so it, is not yeah, the error, so in principle, it will read the error and um, it will propagate the errors and it will give you uncertainties at the end. So if you don't have the error column, you'll still get uncertainties at the end, but they'll be less reliable. Actually, um, for our, our data that we collect with 2D detectors, we very rarely have good error, good errors, so we don't worry about it. I can talk more about that later, but uh, don't worry about the errors. But basically, it's a text file with data in it. Um, but inside each of these directories, there's a file which is called readme.txt. So you can kind of guess what you're supposed to do. So you're supposed to read it. And it just has some very simple information about what you're supposed to do to get going. So. So this is a, this, in this d directory, the first directory, we're just going to refine nickel. And it tells you what the space group is for nickel. It tells you the lattice parameter. It tells you the fractional coordinates for the atoms in the asymmetric unit. And then it tells you a value for a UISO, which is the ADP, the thermal motion parameter. It tells you the Qmax that was used in the data. We should be able to get that from the metadata in the data file itself, but it will do that. And then it gives this Q damp value. I'll come back to that. And then there's a little bit of information about it. So it was collected at 300 Kelvin. It's X-ray data. It was collected at X7B at NSLS. So that's the old synchrotron at Brookhaven that's gone away now. Uh, it used a Perkin Elmer detector, image plate detector. Um, and the goal of this little exercise is basically familiarization with PDF GUI, set up and refine X-ray 300K nickel data. So what you can do is once you have these directories that I'm giving you, each of the directories will have something like this in it. They'll have the same thing and they'll have um, a, a, a goal and some tasks and a little bit of information and data that you need. So for now, what we need is this. We need to know the space group is M3, M3 bar F, M3 bar M, and this lattice parameter. And you don't have to get this exactly right because we're going to do a refinement. So it's basically 3.5, and there's a nickel atom at 000. So we go back here, and we're going to build the structure. So <coughs> we have to put in 3.5 in here and then it's cubic. 
So B is equal to C. You need to know a little bit of crystallography. So we give initial values for A, B, and C of 3.5. And because it's cubic, alpha, beta, gamma are all 90. That's the default. Now we have to add an element down here. And so you just click, you right click on this thing. And there's actually a drop down menu. And it says insert atoms. So if you're not sure about anything, you can always hover over it and then right click. And you might get help. But this is right click insert atoms. And how many rows? So we only have to insert one. So we insert OK. Now the default thing is carbon. But you see when it's blue like that, it's highlighted. So I can single click that and it just moves the cursor. I can double click that and I can highlight it. So here I want to double click it and I want to change that to nickel. And then in the readme file, it told me that nickel was at 000. And it told me that the UISO we should use is 0 0.005. Now I could leave it at 0 0.003, it would actually be fine. But what I can do is I show you that if I drag that, so I, I put my, um, my mouse down, I drag it across, I highlight all those cells. Now I only have to type it once, so 0 0.005. And then I hit enter, and they all update to that value. OK, so everything else is set. So I've made my crystal structure. Now if I highlight this guy, and now if I have my plotting program, Vesta or Atomai, installed, if I select uh, a structure and I press um, this plot, it will plot the structure. So this is actually Vesta, and here is my structure. Now, how's my structure looking? Is it good? It's, yeah, so I entered, I entered all the parameters into the program, but it hasn't given me FCC, it's given me simple cubic. It's given me the wrong structure. So what I have to do is I have to give it the space group information so it knows what symmetry operations to apply to generate any new positions. So we'll actually close that. So what I do is I go here again and I right click. Yeah. Uh, yes, how we have to the edit the yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so you edit preferences and you see this browse button here. So you should have your Vesta executable sitting on your hard drive somewhere. So you just browse to where that is and then you select that. And you need to have the documents in the I'm sorry? No. Um, yeah, that, that's the default. You don't change that. Yeah. You can also click these, like remember path to structure files, remember path to data sets. That means that when you open the program, it will, it will remember how to get there. All right, so I put my mouse over here and I right click. Let's see what's wrong here. OK, so now I have more options. Before, I just had insert atoms, but now I can delete atoms. I can copy and paste. But I can do two things down here. One is I can expand space group. The other is I can create a supercell. So expanding space group means that, OK, I've put the asymmetric unit in. I've put the smallest number of atoms that describes my structure. It's one atom. But now I need to apply the symmetry operations that will generate it. So I'm going to pick expand space group. And now there's a big long list of space groups here that you can pick. Now it's too far down to get to the F3 bar M, so I can just type it in F M minus 3 M. And I don't see it, but anyway, it should be somewhere. 
yeah there it is but I can just type it in and there's no origin offset it's a standard setting so I click OK and now all of a sudden I have four atoms in my unit cell and now if I highlight this guy and I put plot now you'll see it's a beautiful face centered cubic structure okay now I didn't really want to go through the whole refinement thing today maybe we'll do that tomorrow what I'd rather do is I would rather show you how to actually simply calculate a PDF from this so here's a you have fits and then you have phases and you have data and you have calculations so we're going to load data well let's load, let's just load some data actually no let's not let's do a calculation so we'll do a new calculation the calculation goes in here and we can give it a name you should give your things names so you remember it so this is so this this model it's a name for the model now okay sometimes you if it gets stuck like that you have to click on and off so it's nickel and let's call the calibration sanity check so I have a gear wheel up here and when I click gear wheel it's the program's going to do something but what it does depends on what I have selected down here so I want to do my calculation and that's uh, so I can click this thing here and it will calculate it and now I want to plot what I've calculated so down here it said it says done so here at the bottom it says done it did the calculation very quickly here are the default values from zero from zero to ten basically so now I want to plot it so I highlight the calculation that I want to plot and then I click the plotting program and there it is that's my that's my calculation from the nickel Actually, that looks wrong. Maybe I'm not saying. What? The space group? It's not FM3M? Oh, it's got a half, half, half. Yeah. Yeah, there should be. Oh, it's, it's probably because I did it. Did I do it twice? Yeah, probably. Maybe I did it twice by mistake. Okay, so that's good that we did the sanity check, right? So we want this guy. No, we don't want half, 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 right? We want half, half. Uh, we want half off zero okay so this is so is that not that's is that the wrong space group what's this what's the right space group for nickel oh I selected the wrong one. Oh, okay so this is fine this is what we're going to do then we're going to delete all these atoms okay brilliant so it's always good to like make mistakes because you learn more okay expand space group oh yeah F minus 4 bar okay okay great okay that's correct but when I plotted it it looked okay right I, I'm confused oh it was a double sized yeah yeah okay good this is better okay so well now we now it's good we can that's why you should always do a sanity check wait that looks the same what's that 
you have to calculate on sample selection. Oh, I have to, oh yeah, I'm just plotting. I have to calculate. See, so you're a great audience. You're like my students. They never let me play with this program because I'm terrible at it. Ah, nickel, finally. Yeah, so this is PDF of nickel. Very good. Now, um, one last thing then. Let's load a data set. And I don't want to do a refinement because it takes much more setting up. I'd rather you guys start playing. Um, but we'll do a new data set. We load the data set from file. And I have to navigate to where it is. Now I have this data set highlighted and I press plot and it looks like that. Now here's two things I could do to compare it. The calculation was zero to 10. So I could in here, the fit range, I could do up to 10. Or um, I could do this up higher, let's say 20. And it's using matplotlib, if you're familiar with matplotlib. So you can actually do zooming and things. So this is the pan button. And this is the zoom button. So select zoom. And we want to go from 0 to 10. And then we can compare it with the... OK, I don't have the other one plotted. I closed it. Now, when we do a fit, these will be plotted right on top of each other. But like I said, I want to work on that tomorrow. But there they are. This is the measured one at the top and the calculated one at the bottom. So my recommendation then is that you start actually playing around with this one. And if you get a bit further, you can try and get a bit further. But I'm not going to tell all the details until tomorrow. And then there's also the assignments. Does that sound good? And then I'll cruise. If, if you have a problem, put up your hand and I'll try and help you. Okay. All right. And you're allowed to talk now. In fact, talking is encouraged.
when they're, when they're 